<laughs> Greetings, mammalians. Welcome to Wall Street Wildlife. The investing podcast that will help you better understand how to make money in the stock market. I'm Christoph Monkey Pikarski. And I'm Luke the Badger Hallard. Today is the 15th of November. So apologies if we've been a bit spotty, but we're going to get on a regular weekly schedule. Right on. And so with us is our special guest, a.k.a. The Vulture, uh, bringing us news of uh, all things macro and uh, the big view from the branches, from the Vulture's wake about what's going in the macro, on the macro and the market level, on the market level. Uh, Mr. Not Advice, the, the stock market has been rallying massively in the last few days. So obviously things all great, right? Birds are chirping, uh, <laughs> sun is shining, uh, butterflies are floating around, right? Nothing to worry about. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think probably the smartest thing to do right now is to go ahead and margin your account <laughs> to the hilt and uh, get long this market because, um, I mean, the market rallied yesterday on a, um, a CPI print that was point one lower than what was expected. And if you really drill down into it, um, uh, the, the, the BLM decided that, and they, and they let the market know this a couple months ago, they were going to change the way that they computed uh, health insurance. And so if you look at the details of the CPI report, the reason why it came in lower was because they showed health insurance costs going down 34%. Now, I don't know about what world they live in, but my health insurance premiums haven't gone down at all. In fact, I just uh, re-upped in my plan and they were up uh, 7%. Um, and if, you, if you're looking at or in looking at the detail, what they're using, they stopped using health insurance premiums as a measure. They started using health insurance companies' profits as a measure. So the drop, 34% uh, drop had nothing to do with the consumer. Um, it, it was a way for them to show a softer CPI print. And interestingly, this morning, PPI came out, producer price index. So that's the, that's the uh, uh, number or that is the cost of materials for the companies that produce the products. And I did a Twitter post yesterday and I said I predicted that it would come in negative. Um, and it, sure enough, it came in negative today. And negative is actually a signal of uh, it's recessionary. When you see a negative PPI print, um, that's recessionary. So, you know, the, 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 the market right now, I mean, yesterday you had this amazing rally. Uh, talking with some of the market participants that I talked to, you know, their comment was it was almost entirely algorithmic driven, uh, meaning that the algorithms picked up on the CPI, they picked up on the headlines and the news flow. And that's really what drove the market higher. And we also have to remember that CTAs, um, which are uh, classification of professional money managers, I think the number was $58 billion that they had to do of buying this week. And so we, we, there's market structure that goes that that's underneath the price move. And it's important to understand why a market goes up. Uh, you know, it, it, people will look at the stock market being up 400 points yesterday in the Dow and say, wow, everything's great. Uh, actually it's not great. Um, we're seeing recessionary numbers. I'm going to repeat the same thing that I repeat. You know, I spoke about last time. Japan is getting worse, not better. Uh, Japan has announced a stimulus program where effectively everyone's going to get a raise, but the way they're going to do that is they're going to tax corporations by an additional eight percent, and that's inflationary. And so, you know, if you if you really look at the details on a macro basis. You know, my belief is this rally will be short lived. Interestingly, the high of the year on the NASDAQ or the QQQs I'll use, that's an ETF that mirrors the NASDAQ. The high of the year was on 
uh, July 19th and it hit 387.98. Today, um, the high today was 387.65. And as we're speaking now, um, the leader of the market, NVIDIA, uh, is red for the day, as are, uh, you know, some of the chip makers. Um, so, so what I'm seeing on a macro basis is you see consumer credit cards hitting a $1 trillion balance. Okay. We're seeing uh, subprime auto loans hitting a 60 day uh, default rate or non pay rate that's higher than COVID. Um, we're seeing uh, continued pressure in the CRE market, commercial real estate, continue of A class properties. That's a problem. When you see large properties that are the best properties in the city, uh, I just saw a property in Houston that had sold for 110 million uh, four years ago, and they just liquidated it for 26 million. Uh, th these are not signs that the economy is expanding. The stock market should go up when the economy is healthy and expanding. And the only thing expanding right now are stock price multiples. And we are going to have a reversion back to value, back to valuation. Um, what will trigger that? I still think Japan. Japan is going to trigger that. Uh, interestingly, the uh, on the macro basis, also the um, I guess we're, the government's not going to shut down. Uh, much to my chagrin, they were able to pass it. It's continuing resolution, uh, push it out to January, February, and March, and you would expect the market to rally after of that too. It didn't even take notice. So what it's telling me is going back to two thousand and eight. If you look at the period from March to uh, September, uh, the technology sector rallied, I believe, is between 18 and 20 percent, 21 percent. OK, everything was great. No problems. But on the the underneath at, at the structural level, we were watching banks. We were watching interest rates. We were watching some of the issues that I'm seeing now that are much worse. And so. Um, I, I, I'm not surprised by this rally. You know, it's it's like having to wean somebody off of a sugar high. They don't want to be weaned off of it. And they're going to grasp at the very last bit of sugar they can get. And I think that's what we're seeing in the market. To sum it up, I think what's going on is since 2008, retail investors, hedge, all, all investors um, have had pretty much a Fed put in place. The Fed came in with liquidity and they kept pumping liquidity in the market. And we're seeing that be, being draw, drawn down. Um, and, and it's being drawn down significantly too. But these are things that a lot of people don't know and they, they're not watching. So um, short, you know, short answer would be, uh, I, I don't see this rally sustaining much longer. There are still people calling for a Santa Claus rally. We're up 10% in a week. Uh, I think they just got their Santa Claus rally. Um, so we'll have to see what happens, but the, certainly the macro fundamentals. Wow, are thank not you improved. so much, uh, Mr. Nut advice for that thoughtful answer. Uh, hey, Badger, when you, when you hear <clears throat> that as a long-term buy and hold investor who, who in the, uh, portfolio challenge so far the picks you've made are all are all long you know good businesses how does that make you feel what are you thinking now in uh in this context i'm thinking i've got a process i've run for the last 20 years that served me pretty well and i'm sticking to my process right um I, i'm reminded of a tweet i read a couple of weeks ago from those guys, the future investors, you might remember I had coffee with uh, one of the brothers in Amsterdam and really good tweet. I might link it in the show notes. He said, um, uh, is he was talking about Lynch, Buffett and Munger and why are they so successful? Should we copy their behavior? But are you one of them? And so this, this quote from the future investors was the true foundation of success lies in introspection, discover your own investor identity, um, and then, you know, you essentially 
I'll approach the tweet, you know, use that as your kind of guideline. Um, you guys are wading in these complex, murky waters. And I know, uh, I know as the long-term badger buy and hold and sweat the ups and downs, uh, anybody who's looking at kind of technicals shakes their head and say, hey, this guy's got his head in the sand and he's just going to get his ass handed to him. That might well be the case in the short to medium term, but in the really long term, I kind of don't mind because in the very long term, I win anyway. Wow, strong. <laughs> Them's fighting words, uh, Badger. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> meanwhile, uh, um, as everyone knows, well, as, as newcomers to the show are, are learning, I, I too have been an investor for 25 years now. And up to the most recent months, I, I shared Badger's investing strategy, long-term buy and hold. But the things that I am learning from Mr. Not Advice about, I guess, uh, what's happening, you know, what what's going on in the market behind the curtains are giving me the, I would say, additional perspective or toolkit to make trades uh, in directions I never thought I'd be making before. And you're seeing that in, you know, my own current portfolio holdings. So uh, I'm, I mean, I'm not a doomsday sayer either. And I, I don't think Mr. Not Advice is one uh, inherently, but the things that I am seeing, the numbers, the debt, across the board, people beginning to struggle, losing their mortgages. I know that's not made up. So I've never been as scared for the global economy and for what might actually happen as I am now. And portfolio wise, um, you know, I am adjusting. So true to my monkey spirit, I'm going to jump. <laughs> I'm going to jump from branch to branch trying to find the, the safest spot and hopefully make money uh, on the way down. You know, what I, what my belief is, is that we're, uh, we're in a rolling recession. If you look at it, we have different sectors getting hit at different times. And the biggest sector has yet to be hit, which is real estate. And real estate is a huge part of our economy from building to home buying to the materials and um, to office. So that's the part that frightens me the most, just knowing what the, the amount of debt, you know, uh, just remember you've got commercial properties out there that were originally financed at, you know, two and 3%. Well, they have to refi now six, seven, 8%. That's going to absolutely collapse cap rates. And that's if they had, vacancy of 95, 96%, which they do not. We work filing bankruptcy is a huge deal. Uh, they were one of the largest commercial real estate owners in the country. Uh, we just, we haven't seen those losses booked yet. So yeah, I think we're, I think what we'll get is a pause, but I think at the end of the day, the Fed's going to be forced right back into it and is going to have to raise rates again. I, I, I'm in the minority. People think, oh, we're going to have a cut now. We're going to have a cut in March. Uh, you know, they're, they're, you know, the, the Goldman's, they're out there. You know, hey, we're going to see two, two percent, 200 basis points cut in 2024. Uh, I don't see that. I'm not looking at the macro. So, well, so the takeaway here, uh, folks, is if you want good news, vultures wake. <laughs> it's not our resident vulture is not your guy. <laughs> not right. Not right now. Right. Not uh, yet. Uh, not yet. Listeners, you can find more from Mr. Not Advice on his website, mrnotadvice.com, on which he has a burgeoning community member uh, Discord channel. I encourage all of you to go check it out. Boss, thanks so much for, for checking in with us. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, Have Richard. a great day. Okay, bye. All right, Badger. So <laughs> do you want to check in on, uh, on our portfolios? Let's, let's do that. I'm super keen to hear from you. But before we do, a uh, quick reminder if you're listening to this podcast, we are brand new. Uh, this is only episode like two or three with a bonus episode. Um, 
and you, you guys need to help us get traction. If you were fans of the show when we were doing No Limit, or you've just found us because I'm playing around like an idiot on Instagram and TikTok trying to figure out these newfangled social networks that make no sense at all to me, help us get some traction. I think that's by liking and subscribing on your podcast platform of choice or on YouTube, or just do it the old fashioned way. Tell a buddy who uh, you think might be interested in hearing our content to go check us out. Yeah, help us out. <laughs> Please. Uh, we're, we're panhandling on the on the interwebs. So, Luke, I made an interesting observation. You know, we were uh, we're now posting our real life money king of the jungle portfolio results, competition results on on X and uh, on the socials, and I realized that my I'm using SoFi. And that my account, when I took the screenshot, it looked really ugly. It had like yours. Well, not just the numbers. (laughs) Those those (laughs) temporary are not great either. But that's a secondary point. But, you know, you had the icons of of your companies and they looked really logo-ish and, you know, clearly identifiable. And when I looked at mine, it was just the letters, like a blue circle and the letter. Like there was one C, A, E, R for, for the different companies. I was like, man, mine looks so horrible, right? This it just looks aesthetically so much worse. Like, what's wrong with SoFi? They they can't even, you know, use company logos. False. The problem is that all it turns out, all four of the companies that I've invested in are so still under the radar that they don't get their own logos. It's not that SoFi <laughs> doesn't use logos. <laughs> it's it's that my particular companies are not uh, fancy enough uh, to deserve a logo, which led me to a very clear oh, you, But you're, you're choosing junk, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, so this is important, right? I mean, I, I think uh, I squeezed your shoes a little bit on the X saying, you know, if you want, if you want the elitist, you know, a holier than thou stuff, go, go follow Badger. But, you know, if you want the companies of the, of, of the, uh, I guess in jungle terms, uh, of the earth, right? The, the fungi, the, the companies that make the whole microsystem go, uh, stick with, stick with monkey. I the, want... uh, the fertilizer, the fertilizer that's on my, my beautiful <laughs> stock crops. Yeah. Okay. Tell us about your, tell us about your fertilizer. Cause I looked at your portfolio snapshot. I haven't got a damn clue what you own. Explain it to us, please. <laughs> All right. So I want to talk about based on what, what our resident vulture just said, it's not that I don't believe in great businesses for the long, long term. Uh, it's what I've done for for the majority of my investing career. However, I do think things are an absolute mess right now economically. And so I am looking for companies that to me have, I, I call them asymmetric risks, but they, they're different degrees of that. I'm looking for companies that I think it's not just that they're valuation plays, but that they have the widest delta between what I truly understand is their value proposition. And that for one reason or another, the market just doesn't get what's truly happening underneath. So I'm making these these uh, essentially bets that over time, the market will uh, come to its senses. And this is a little bit about the old argument you you'll hear investors talking about asking themselves, is the market efficient or not? And in some ways, I think it's a paradoxical question and answer in, it depends on the level of that you're looking at it. For the most part, I would argue it's efficient, meaning there's so much information out there. It's accurately represented in price and more or less at that moment. Uh, it's figured out what the, in general, what something ought to be valued. That said, I know from experience that there's lots of money to be made by exploiting the places and moments where the market is not efficient, that it does not know everything uh, for all kinds of complicated reasons. So that's a long wind up to say my top holding, the one that... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I can't believe you squeezed my shoes about uh, my monkey fur or you already you already stole some bananas from me by pointing out that uh, 
I already want to allocate more money to the portfolio per month than what we originally <laughs> agreed. Because, <laughs> because <laughs> when Coherus, ticker symbol CHRS, dropped what I think is a, a it's kind of a, 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 a I'm stumbling because it's kind of like a jaw dropping amount below what I think it's intrinsic valuation is worth that I could not keep my furry paws off the buy button. So I ended up uh, buying something like 40, 50 percent of our initial allocation of the thousand dollars into Coherus. Uh, biosciences because I'm like this this window of of this gap will not la- last very long and I wasn't going to sit around you know waiting for the market to figure out just how much it's oversold this this company so and what what happened to that fifty percent? I went down a little bit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because so. this is the thing, right? Yeah. Uh, when the market, you know, starts. So, so let me, let me, uh, once a company breaks its all time low, you have to realize that the majority of trading is done as our vulture was saying by algorithms. It looks like for the most part, you know, when you see buying and selling, that's humans buying and selling. That's not true. Think about the world we live in. It's massive, powerful computers programmed to mathematically test prices. Once a stock drops below its all-time low, technically what that means is there is no more data below that price. And the algorithms basically get to have a field day uh, seeing that it's kind of once the stock is removed from fundamentals like coherence is at the moment, there's massive money to be made pressing the the stock further and further and further down to the short side. So I got a little bit what I would say over um, ambitious or a a little bit quick to the draw. And I bought a big chunk once it fell down uh, a significant amount and then it kept falling and I added a little bit more as it fell. So right now, Luke, my entire portfolio is right now worth at this moment, 863 cool bananas. So that is uh, a loss of 14% in our first month. Uh, And that's uh, predominantly having to do with uh, the losses in Coherence and EOS. You know, I... uh... We, I, I'd be interested in talking about your other non-equity holding as well, but let's maybe we'd say that for a future episode. But um, like my own portfolio is like up a slow and steady six percent since we started. Like my thousand bucks is now a thousand and sixty bucks. Um, I'm doing better than I expected, to be honest. Um, and if the world collapses in the way that we sort of discussed at the top of the episode, I'm expecting to give a lot of that back. So I've kept like a good chunk, four hundred dollars. I've kept. Uh, on the sidelines for now, so I can buy in at a lower value point. Um, but your it rankles me as the badger. Your uh, the way you describe, um, you know, the way you're thinking about coherent biosciences and algorithms pushing the price lower. To me, this stuff is all irrelevant, right? It's all short term nonsense and magic, and things just all behave ra- like a random system. And if you're a technical trader, you know, you try and make predictions, but it's a complex, chaotic system. I'm not sure you can. Uh, I'm, you know, I, I, I wait to be proven wrong. Um, but surely you acknowledge that the thing that fundamentally drives Coherence's success isn't price action. It's uh, the company's success as a business, the drugs it sells, like its market size, its patent portfolio, all the real things in the real world. Surely it's more sensible to focus on those. Oh boy, there's so much to say there. It's both and. It's both and. The simplest, for fear of running long, I think, I think what we, I, I want to leave it by saying multiple levels of reality coexist 
and that's actually a complex thing to really truly begin to understand and integrate. <clears throat> and in the short term, I do believe that the market responds much more in the sense to the thing you call magic, which is price action, which is all the quants and all the math and all the computing trading. But over the long term, as you know, the stock market over the very long periods just drifts upward and that and it traces the value created by a company. <clears throat> and so what I'm trying to do and get better at is take advantage of both. And so when I see a major divergence in short term price action, I'm not going to ignore it and simply say that's magic or hocus pocus. I know that with the proper call it tools and skill set, you can look at that and probabilistically take advantage of that and make the short term stuff work in your favor. And simultaneously know the game you're playing and and know which level of reality you're operating on and try to also not exclude questions of fundamental value. And it's, it's what I'm trying to do is, is, um, I call it complicated, especially if you're a beginning investor. I would, it's not a world I think I'll ever step into, I guess, as I said, in response to the question way earlier on this episode, I've got my process. I'm going to be a bit of a stick in the wall badger. I know this works for me and I fear that so late in the game as someone who's probably halfway through their life or more, um, if I start trying to do funky stuff now, I might under, undermine, fatally undermine my kind of fundamental based approach. It's a, you know what, Luke, it's a great question. It's a great open question. And I think in terms of, you know, providing value to our listeners, uh, it'd be amazing. It'd be an amazing outcome. Not necessarily if you, for example, uh, it, let me say it this way. It'd be an amazing outcome if on this, our second episode, you, 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 you say, right, this, this alternate strategy is not for me. It's too late in the game. But then 30 episodes later, let's say I keep posting the results and let's say the evidence kind of mounts that what I'm doing works or doesn't, it, it could go, it'll go either way, right? That you, uh, remain open enough to say, well, what if, for example, I retain my long-term strategy, but then I use a small chunk of my portfolio to explore the alternate strategies? That might be an interesting outcome for you and for our listeners, or not. So, that's, yeah, okay, so, okay, so yeah, so I guess yeah, you've got to take us through some of your thinking at some point, like tell us specifically what you've done. I'll tell you a trade I did today. Uh, I bought another hundred dollars worth of stock. I bought stock in one of my favorite UK companies, Wise, the uh, international um, money transfer service, but they're now essentially a person in a business bank. And I, I bought stock in them today because I love the company. They just delivered fantastic half yearly results a few days ago. Um, and here I am in Hong Kong and Thailand taking full advantage of my Wise account and just reminding myself what a fantastic service it is. If you're using um, any other bank, uh, when you're traveling overseas and paying uh, really irrational interest rates and fees and charges, check out wise.com and, uh, and see how much money you could be saving. Big fan. Right on. So let's make sure. So let's end our, our episode with uh, what we want to introduce as the, uh, the Batcave. Where we have a, we have a, one of my closest friends is also our, our esteemed podcast and video producer. So he's the guy that's going to edit our show and all, all of the amazing uh, jungle sounds and the animals that you see uh, come from his, the work of his good hands. Well, hey guys, if you're, uh, if you're listening to this on a podcast, like go, just go check out our promo trailer. Bats did a fantastic job of making us sound coherent and uh, almost almost kind of putting us up there with like the TikTok kids in terms of uh, engaging graphics. So check it out. Yeah, that's right. We're going to be cool one of these days, Luke. So, <laughs> so instead of, so we came up with a great idea. Actually, he suggested it. 
that instead of paying him for the work of the many, many hours he's putting into producing us, we're going to, amongst ourselves, have a conversation as to what stock we would recommend for him. And we're going to chip in a, a little bit of our own cash dollars to build a portfolio for him. And we're essentially taking our own medicine. So, and we're doing this real time. We didn't script this. So Luke, at this moment, what is your best recommendation for what we ought to buy for bats? Uh, of my entire portfolio and the stuff I've bought for my Wall Street wildlife portfolio, my favorite position right now is Mercado Libre. So you're saying you're you're saying uh, we're going to put a little bit of cash dollars buying shares or partial shares of Mercado Libre. That's your uh, and I say that from a, that that's that would be my vote. And, and I so this let's make this back cave segment. This should be like the best of both of our portfolios. Because hey, how fantastic would it be if we get to the end of our portfolio competition in a year's time and bats as a percentage return has actually kicked both of our butts if that comes to pass i guess i hope this is true because you know not only will he have compounded the uh, the earnings on making our videos but also that will have demonstrated how the sum of the parts as an investor is greater than the whole if you can find a buddy uh, who's somewhat like-minded but also challenges you as christoph and i do to each other um those debates are invaluable in terms of weeding out best companies and eliminating the dross. Yeah. So I, I, uh, I love Mercado Libre. The ticker is M E L I. However, uh, I've, I guess I've must've really swallowed the, uh, bear pill recently because I do not see the global economy doing well. And Mercado Libre is, uh, in part of a fi finance company. I mean, it, it, it mm -hmm. runs yep. the business yep. of South America. And when some dominoes start falling, I just don't see companies involved in, in finance and banking uh, uh, being immune to whatever severe drops. So, so uh, I won't, I won't veto. I don't know if, if we have veto powers, but, but I, I'm just putting that caveat out there. What was uh, your pitch, Christoph? Right now, I just, I cannot see anything besides Coheres as having, <laughs> <laughs> as having <laughs> immense, immense untapped value. So the short pitch on Coheres is that they make biosimilars the company is about to have four drugs on the market at the sort of very early stages of expanding market share the money coming in from that will be used to fund their immuno oncology assets which have great promising clinical data meanwhile the company is valued at nearly, it's, uh, their mar market cap is nearly equal to the cash they have on their balance sheet. So it's as though you're, you're I mean, it's not, uh, it's not, it's almost as you're getting the business for free. It's c shockingly, shockingly undervalued. All the company has to do now is execute, which they have been uh, in terms of getting these drugs to market. It's just that it's taken them several years to do it. So right at the moment where I think the market has the most pessimism around the company is exactly the moment where market share is going up, revenue is going up, margins are going up, and they're closing the gap toward profitability, which is exactly the scenario you want as an investor. So I nominate Coherus. But you've heard this term, right? Winners keep winning, losers keep losing. My, uh, my Mercado Libre position's up 22% just since I bought it in the Wall Street Wildlife portfolio. It's my biggest winner, whereas your Coherus position is down, what, 30%? Um, like, th these things tend to keep moving in the same direction uh, unless something materially has changed. Well, <laughs> uh, <laughs> in the short term, I suppose, you know, anything could happen. 
uh, in you, general, you... I, I don't disagree with that. You know, I'm not going to be, it, it, I mean, that, that is true. The best businesses in the world get better. I'm look, you know, I'm, but as I said, you know, none of my, none of my companies have fancy logos. So I'm looking in, <laughs> I guess in the, in the donkey pile. And, and the thing is in the donkey pile, one right call one out of say 10 could pay for the other nine by by multitudes and i see massive massive potential and coheres at this moment so that's my nomination so what do you say well, how's it sound we buy them we buy them both so it's uh one from each of us uh for bats's editing portfolio and we see how he does right on cool so we're going to start his right. his uh his investing journey with a little Mercado Libre, M-E-L-I, and a little bit of Coherus, C-H-R-S, and cross our fingers that, <laughs> <laughs> that that they don't implode. So how's that? So, let's, so we're sort of figuring this out as we go, but how about once a month we revisit the Batcave and then we'll pick a stock each for Bats's portfolio and we'll, uh, I, don't, don't get wrangled up in any like, dubious tax things like get bats to open his own investment account uh but and we'll pay him legitimately and he'll pay tax on that money presumably and then he'll buy the stock with that money we'll do things properly but uh but we'll, we'll be steering him as to how to invest that money yeah that that sounds great <laughs> cool. all right so that that uh wraps it up right for episode uh three three episode three i think it's episode three, episode three. Yeah. three. uh yeah, yeah. You can find us at uh, wallstreetwildlife.com. Starting point for those who know there's an intelligent and principled way to become wealthy, but haven't yet found a good jungle guide. That's right. Just listen to your monkey. <laughs> you can find me on Twitter or X. I'm at 7 Luke Hallard. And I am at 7 Flying Platypus. Do tweet us and let us know if you're Team Badger or Team Monkey in the Portfolio Challenge. I think you'd be kind of dumb to jump on Team Monkey right now. He's in the hole and he's just digging himself deeper. <laughs> and, and, and ladies and gents, just FYI, the smack talk that I've been hearing in our <laughs> private private WhatsApp, WhatsApp conversations, I, I won't... Uh, <laughs> I, I don't want to <laughs> sell your ears, but, but it ain't pretty. Know that receipts are being kept. That's all. That's all you need to know. <laughs> <laughs> Until next week. Look forward to catching up, buddy. All right, Badger. A reminder that the people on this program may hold positions in the companies that are mentioned. Buying and selling stock carries financial risk, which could include loss of capital. The views in this program should not be taken as personalized advice. Before acting on any of the information provided, listeners are encouraged to consult a financial or tax professional.